we need to talk about constitutional reform. Now, in our last video, we talked about uh, what, what a constitution is and the fact that the UK's constitution is um, uncodified, unentrenched. And in many ways, the UK's constitution remained very static and changed very, very little from, well, kind of forever. I mean, there's a few major changes, the Bill of Rights, the Magna Carta, uh, Parliament Act, and, and, and things like that. You know, there are some key major changes. But when you look at how long those changes take, you're looking at basically the entire history of the United Kingdom. Um, we have these key moments where there's a significant change, but by and large, the UK constitution evolves very little, very slowly, um, almost kind of imperceptibly so, other than those key events that I mentioned. But this changes in 1997. Because in 1997, Tony Blair's government comes to power after 18 years of conservative rule under Margaret Thatcher and John Major. And I hope it's not being biased to say that the country was ready for a change. If you go and look at the videos of Tony Blair walking to Downing Street in 1997, you know, it's almost like the Messiah. You know, some sort of religious figure has, has kind of come to power. You know, there was cheering, there was whooping, there was flags waving. Um, the country was ready for something different. And Labour not only brought in some different forms of policies that were more to the left, but they also came in with a significant plan for constitutional reform. And we're going to be looking at their key reforms in this video. And in many ways, this constitutional reform has continued since then. Um, both the Cameron governments, kind of the May government and the Johnson governments have actually continued to change how our country is run. Now, just before we start, of course, I do want to draw a distinction between a constitutional reform and, and a reform. Um, a constitutional reform is, is, is anything that has to do with how the country is run, the separation of powers, elections, government. Um, if, you have a, if you have a major change to a law that impacts your lives, then, that, then that's very important, but it's not necessarily... Um, constitutional. So, so we're only looking at those things here that in many ways might seem minor, but actually they do change how the country um, is governed. So let's get learning. So here they are, the architects of New Labour, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, I should probably add in Peter Mandelson and various other ones as, as well. But they come to power in 1997. Let's use some keywords. They are legitimate because they win by a landslide, huge amounts. They have a mandate for change because most of this constitutional reform was written in their manifesto, so the public knew what they intended to do. Um, and they have a big enough majority in Parliament to get these reforms through. It's probably as close as we... We, as we get to a uh, to an elected dictatorship in this country, like they more or less could have done what they wanted because they had so many Labour MPs to go along with what um, they wanted. And I'm, I'm not saying that in a scary way or a villainous way. I'm just kind of pointing out this is one of the features of our system that this large majority meant that when they wanted to bring in these constitutional changes, although there was resistance, there was arguments, there were rebels. The chances of them not getting through were, was was relatively small, but we will look on a on a case by case basis. Now, let's just talk a little bit about exam questions here. Now, I can't predict the exact exact exam questions, but they will always be if they mention constitutional reforms. It has to be an argument. It has to be a debate. It's never going to be what were the constitutional reforms. Um, it might be evaluate to what extent they were successful. Um, evaluate whether they were more important than constitutional constitutional reforms that came later or something like that. But there, there's going to be an angle on this. So when I'm through this video, and then this video, by the way, is the starting point to your research. So do look at the textbooks and 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 do some kind of googling and watch some videos on these. And and also the autobiographies of these politicians is brilliant on these. Um, but you do need to be thinking, I need to go beyond understanding just what these are as in to or well, what was the impact and to what extent they were successful. The other thing I want to draw here before we get started into the full content is there's a reason why I'm doing 1997 to 2010. And that is because the exam specification mentions reform from 97 to 2010. And then it mentions reform from 2010 plus, which means that an exam question can specifically talk about these periods of reform separately. So you need to know which band of reform these reforms fit in. Or to be blunt, was it a reform that New Labour did or was it a reform that the Conservatives meant? Um, you might just get a question that just says constitutional reform, in which case talk about whatever you want. Um, but it's probably it could 
specify a particular range of constitutional reforms um, that you need to discuss. So let's do it. Let is do it. Now, these reforms that they did, um, broadly speaking, went into four key areas. So these are not the reforms themselves. These are the main principles behind their reform reforms. The first was decentralization. Um, Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative government had been very top heavy, i.e. they had this kind of hierarchy at the top um, and they, they kind of sent the instructions down and out. She was a very, very, very strong leader. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just calling it. And in fact, in many ways, they centralized because Margaret Thatcher abolished something called the GLC, which was the Greater London Council. So she pulled more power upwards. Labour wanted to go the other way. They wanted to kind of distribute power outwards to, to regional levels so everything wasn't being done by the central government but people had more representation at a local level and other, play, other decisions could be made closer to the people that it impacted. They wanted to improve the democratisation of the country in terms of um, elections and, and rights and representation. They wanted the government to be more transparent, so, so decisions weren't made like in secret, away from, from the people, but decisions were kind of open and people could kind of trust what the government was doing and, and why those decisions were made. And they also wanted to make um, a significant impact in, in, uh, on human rights and to um, move a lot of the rights that had been in common law into statute law and you should know those phrases from the from the previous the previous video so these were the key areas that they wanted to to tackle so how did they do it one of the biggest changes that the new labor government brought to um the country was what's called devolution and this is such a big topic and there's so much to kind of say here that i'm going to give this its own lecture in the future um, so I'm just going to just give the very broad basics here. But the idea was is that they is that Blair's government wanted to create regional parliaments, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament, the Northern Northern Irish Assembly. They wanted to make people feel that the regions were not just being governed by England, which is perhaps one of the things that Scotland felt or um, or, or Wales felt, but that they had their own representation. And they used a referendum to do this. They didn't just say, here's your parliament. They went to the people of Scotland and they said, here is a referendum. Do you want your own parliament? And uh, Scotland voted yes by quite a large majority. Wales voted yes by a teeny tiny majority, which was interesting because you'd think if someone says to you, hey, do you want your own parliament? You'd say yes. Like if I said to you, hey, do you want a fiver? You'd say yes. Um, but Wales wasn't keen. Wales was actually far more on the, on the kind of like, well, what's this, how will this kind of change um, our, our country? Do we necessarily dislike the, 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 the Westminster system? But this led to the creation of regional parliaments, and you probably recognize Nicola Sturgeon here. And the impact of this has been huge. You know, we have had a massive rise of nationalist politics in this country, the, the, the SNP. Labour never really foresaw the rise of the SNP. They, they kind of thought that the that devolution would actually kind of stop nationalistic feeling in Scotland. And actually the opposite has, has happened. Um, the regional parliament in Northern Ireland um, has had huge amounts of problems, but in the same breath, it's actually helped to really bring peace to that region. But we'll look at that more in the devolution um, video. And they did actually attempt to have more devolution um, in the northeast, um, but there was a rejection of that in a referendum. The northeast said, no, 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 we don't want a regional parliament. So instead, what they've done is gone down more a, a local mayor route. And, and of course, as part of devolution, I would also probably include things like the London mayor when he, Boris Johnson was there. And, we, and we've got um, uh, Tom at the moment. Sorry, I can't, can't, can't remember his first name. It's very early in the morning. And um, and then you've got, also got mayors in Liverpool and Manchester. And so, so devolution is not is parliaments, but also these local, represent, ro local representatives and leaders um, that has made an impact to the country. Uh, you know, we now have different laws in different places in certain areas. The, the, the COVID was very different, dealt with very differently in different places in the UK. And even now COVID passports are different in different areas of the UK. It's changed the parties that are successful um, in different parts. Um, perhaps this wasn't necessarily the intention of devolution, but the impact has been, has been big, it's been big. And this is definitely something I wanna talk about. The House of Lords is not elected. It is part of our legislature, but it is not elected. And Blair's government felt that this was wrong and it was time that they wanted to do 
seriously change who was in the House of Lords. At that time, quite a, a big chunk of the House of Lords was hereditary. That means, you know, my dad is Lord, Lord Coxicle of, of, um, Lord Coxicle of Watford, and when he dies, I will become the new Lord Coxicle of Watford, and I will get to go in the House of Lords. And just because of my birthright, I get to vote on, on British laws. And it was felt that this was out of date in the 1990s, and it was, it was not liberal, uh, it was not meritocracy, it was, it, um, well, kind of, monarchy really uh, ruling, ruling classes um, and Blair wanted to to change that um, and he wanted to get rid of all of the hereditary peers but despite having that large majority that I mentioned in the, the kind of the preamble he had to compromise um, not everyone felt that they wanted to get rid of all the hereditary peers not everyone felt that that this huge change to the legislature was a great idea and of course the House of Lords is part of Parliament. So if you want to make a change to the House of Lords, the House of Lords has to agree. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about um, Parliament and how it works. So, you, so the Commons can't really just say to the House of Lords, change. Um, there are ways of forcing it through, but we'll come back to that. But they, they, they had to kind of compromise with them and bargain with them. And, and you know, tip, tip for the future, it's always better if you can take people with you when making an awkward decision rather than kind of forcing it upon them. So the compromise was that the hereditary peers would be reduced. So you could argue that this reform was never actually completed. Um, but what actually happened was they, they reduced the amount of hereditary peers down from about, um, from a few hundred down to 92. And, it, and that number is now always static. So if there's 92 and if one of them dies or one of them retires, that one, that, nine, that one is then replaced. So now in this country, you actually have two tiers of lords. You have lords that are able to sit in the House of Lords and lords that are not able to sit in the House of Lords. Hereditary, hereditary lords I'm talking about here. And so the 92, um, there is always 92. That is a static number. Um, the other lords in the house of lords are what are what are called life peers which are people that are nominated for their services to society or the country and um, for their skill set life peers have actually been around i think since the 1960s i might need to check the date on that one so that one wasn't a reform but what was the reform is that the balance of the house of lords shifted away massively from the hereditary peers to the life peers and peer i'm using that term quite a lot a peer is a term for a member of the House of Lords. It's spelled P-E-E-R. Um, so that was, uh, it, it was a big shift. As an impact of this, the House of Lords has become increasingly active and more rebellious and more likely to disagree with the government. It, it has become more legitimate. Now, you might be thinking, well, it, it's, no, it's not elected, so why is it more legitimate? But if I said to you, what, remember, legitimacy is a scale. It's not just a yes or no. And if I said to you, what is more legitimate, um, a bunch of people whose dads were, that, were the Lord, so now they're the Lord, or people that have been appointed because they have shown themselves to have a serious skill set in the country, you know, we'd, we'd say the second. So, and it has become more legitimate because of this. Um, and some of the work they have done has been very important, and I would argue has actually been very beneficial um, to the country. Um, New lords are appointed by the Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister gets to appoint a, a certain number a year. Um, the Leader of the Opposition gets to appoint a few. Um, but there's also an, an appointment commission whose role it is to independently go out and say, well, who should be a member of the House of Lords? Who has, deser who has deserved it? Who has um, contributed to British society and has a skill set that we perhaps need in the House of Lords? So how, the House of Lords is not just politicians, although there's a lot of them. But it's also scientists, composers, TV presenters, charity workers, business people, etc., etc. You know, it, it is supposed to be a kind of a government of all the talents or goats, as it might be. Now, but Blair did have plans to make the House of Lords elected, or at the very least, partially ele partially elected. There was a plan at one point to maybe make a third of it elected, a third of it appointed, a third of it hereditary. That you know, there was various different plans, but they stopped. House of Lords reform was partially completed, and you can see it by the 92 remaining, and you can also see it by the fact that they originally thought about having a, an elected second chamber. If you go to America, you've got the Senate, you've got the House of Representatives, they're both elected. They're both elected. That, you know, in the British system, we only have one elected chamber out of two. Um, there's a really interesting argument and a debate to be had about whether 
it is better to have a second elected chamber or whether it's better to have a second appointed chamber like we have people have very strong opinions on this one it's perhaps a politically nerdy thing rather than something that you might discuss down the pub but um this reform was never completed but you could argue that what we've ended up with actually works better we can discuss this in class when we when we do the legislature electoral reform labor had been out of power for 18 years four general elections in a row they had lost four and a big reason for that is our electoral system, the way that we vote for our governments. And so Blair, and together with the Liberal Democrats, said, when we get into power, we're going to change the electoral system to make it more fair, because our system isn't very fair. You could argue that it works. You could argue that it's functional. You could argue that it's actually benefited the country, but we couldn't call it fair. Um, and so when they came to power, they said, we are going to change the electoral system. But Labour won under our electoral system, which is called first past the post, by a huge amount. Um, the, the two wheels here, the, the, the inner wheel shows the percentage of the vote they got, and the outer wheel shows the percentage of seats they got. And what you can see here is that New Labour got, look at the inner wheel, New Labour gets about 45, 46% of the vote, you know, a big chunk. But the amount of seats they got is more like up about 60%. So kind of Blair and Brown get into power here under first past the post and think, do we really want to change this system right now? Now, is this the right time to really be changing it? Because it's actually currently benefiting us. Politics, my friends, there's always going to be an area, of, uh, an element of cynicism. And parties which are hurt by the electoral system always want to change it. And parties which benefit from our electoral system always kind of say, well, maybe we should just leave it as it is. Um, so Tony Blair did what many politicians do, is he kicked the can down the road, uh, meaning we'll deal with this in a bit. And one of the popular ways of doing that in politics is to send someone off to make a report and hope that that report comes down, comes back in a few years and you don't have to deal with it. And so he sent off a man called um, Roy Jenkins, um, who is actually a very important figure in British politics in the 60s, 70s and 80s, and come and ask him, ask me about him. Um, and they sent him off and they said, Roy Jenkins, please would you make a report about what we should change our electoral system to. And so he goes off and he has a good think and he does lots of research and does lots of surveys and he actually invents a brand new electoral system called AV+. And he brings it back and he says, good, this is, this is the perfect system for Britain. And New Labour goes, great. And that's the last we ever hear of it um, because they ignore it. This constitutional change never happens. But, but, when the regional parliaments were created, Scottish Parliament, Welsh Parliament, Welsh, Welsh Assembly, Northern Irish Assembly, and some of the, the local mayors, they all use new electoral systems. None of them use the same system that our Westminster government has. Um, and this has had an impact in terms of allowing other parties to kind of come forward to give a more proportional result than first past the post does. Um, so although electoral reform never took place in Westminster, and maybe never will, electoral reform, newer electoral systems have been used in the other smaller regional parliaments and elections that we have across the country. The Human Rights Act. Now remember, one of the things that the New Labour government wanted to do was to move human rights laws from common law, as in rulings by judges, into statute law. And the other thing they wanted to do was that they wanted to take lots of the different laws that had been uh, done over time, so laws about gender discrimination, laws about race discrimination, laws about disability discrimination, and put them all into one document. But perhaps the most important reason they did it, or the key reason they did it, and let's be a little bit more cynical here, is they, they wanted to take the Human Rights Act, which Europe was using, European Convention on Human Rights. I think I'm getting my knowledge. There's so many European human rights things, I might be getting this confused, and I'm sorry if I am. But the, they wanted to take the European Convention of Human Rights, a European law, and make it a UK law. This meant that... UK judges could start to be using the, this act to make rulings here rather than having to go to European courts over in Strasbourg and Brussels um, to make um, rulings instead. So it was also a way of enabling the UK legal system to be, become more prominent in making 
um, rulings. Because what was happening at the moment was that when there was a, a disagreement over something, over a European law or a human rights thing, people were going to another country in Europe and saying, well, there's a problem here in the UK, and the European courts were making rulings that were affecting the UK. And so the New Labour wanted UK law courts to be able to make UK rulings. But to do that, the law had to be brought into UK statute. So there's there's a few different reasons there that I've given you why the the Human Rights Act came into an existence. It leads to better and clearer citizens' rights. You are protected by the Human Rights Act, and so am I. And it's become a little bit sacrosanct, sacrosanct. Um, meaning kind of a bit holy, a bit special, and and various governments like the Conservatives have talked about changing the Human Rights Act. Um, and whenever they do, there's this kind of like horror from a lot of liberals in the UK, thinking you, know, you can't mess with the Human Rights Act. This is like messing about with the the Bill of Rights Act, Bill of Rights in in America. You know, this is our constitutional rights. Um, leave it alone. And so it's it's almost become entrenched, not politic, not um, legally because we don't have entrenchment, but almost politically entrenched. Um, changing the human changing the Human Rights Act would be would be controversial. Some newspapers would really go for it. Some political thinkers would would really go for it and say. But of course, it is not a higher law in the UK because there is no entrenchment. There is no such thing as a law that overrides another law. You know, we could make a law that says. Um, you cannot discriminate on the basis of race and put it in the Human Rights Act. And we could make a law that says, oh, but you can discriminate for this reason. And that law would not overrule this law. They would just headbutt. You know, those two laws would would conflict. And then it would be down to a judge to kind of say, well, how, how are we going to sort this out? Or the government would then have to kind of say, well, there's a, there's a lack of um, clarity here. So unlike in America, where a constitutional Bill of Rights law will quash, meaning squish, meaning getting rid of, um, another law. That doesn't happen here. Um, the Human Rights Act meant that things that the government did could start to be subjected to the Human Rights Act. Um, and this was probably foreseen by Labour, like they did realise that by making a Human Rights Act they were going to be challenged, but they, they believed that was a, a good thing. It must be very frustrating for a politician when it happens. Um, but they did want to, because because they were liberal and, and believed in formalizing rights, formal rights and foundational rights, they, they wanted that to be the case. And this was first seen, or first majorly seen, in something that became known as the Belmarsh case. And, and that uh, banner there says, no detention without trial. There was a bunch of terrorist suspects that were highly suspected to be planning terrorist attacks. But it could not be proven. So the government and the police services locked them up without trial. And that is illegal in this country. You know, you have, you have the right to a fair trial and you have the right not to be imprisoned unless you have had a trial. You can be arrested for a short period of time, like until your trial. So if you were arrested, they can keep you locked up until your trial. And then when you have your trial, they can keep you locked up. Um, that's allowed. But what's not allowed is just to lock you up and say, well, we're not sure when we're going to let you out. Um, without a sentence, without a trial, without a, a guilty verdict, and so on. But these terrorist suspects were, and the government was saying, and it's, it's a difficult debate, the government was saying, well, we think these people are a real threat to people in this country, and we think if we let them out, people could die. But on the other side, other people were saying, these people have done nothing wrong. There has been no trial. There has been no proof. Like, if you could prove these people were guilty of something, then do it. But, you, but they couldn't. And the Belmarsh case was when the UK government was taken to court to say, you have to let these people go, or you have to do a trial. Um, and the, and the, the, because of the human, and the, and the Human Rights Act was used to say, to show that these people had rights and the government was breaking the Human Rights Act, and so the government had to release them or charge them. So the government's actions were changed as a result. Since then, there have been many uh, rulings because of the Human Rights Act, and we'll look at this when we do the um, when we look at the Supreme Court. Um, if any of you are interested in going into law, it's a fascinating um, piece of um, a, fa a fascinating thing to study, looking at these cases, and you can see that the impact that the Supreme Court has had on making governments think, "Can we really do that?" Whereas before they might have just done something, now they come to kind of think, "Well, 
what about our citizens' rights? Which is, is probably a good thing. It's probably a good thing. Although the, the security argument would say, well, actually, sometimes awkward decisions have to be made. The Freedom of Information Act. Blair has argued this was one of his biggest mistakes. And politicians don't like to admit mistakes. They often get asked that awkward question of, what's your biggest regret? And they always kind of say something like, oh, I wish I could have done more. Um, Blair has said he thinks this was a mistake because it didn't have the impact that it was supposed to have. And instead, it has actually made politics harder. The idea behind the, the Freedom of Information Act is, as the name says, you have the freedom to get information. It means that you can go to the government or your local government or various businesses or public institutions and say, what information do you have on me? Or what did you do about this? Or what happened here? Or give me the documents related to this or that. And the Freedom of Information Act says that you have the right to get it. Now, there's all sorts of restrictions. So you can't go to the government and say, where are oral nuclear weapons? Um, and you can't go there and say, what, I, what happened in that meeting last week? I want to know right now. Um, so there's various restrictions based on safety and time and uh, privacy and things like that. But by and large, most things can be requested if you ask the right question to the right person. Now, the reason why they did this is because they wanted to make government more transparent. They wanted people to trust their politicians. They didn't want uh, decisions to be made behind uh, closed political doors. And they wanted to be open about why decisions were being made. The reason why Blair has said this is one of his mistakes is because the impact was it meant that conversations in politics stopped being real. Like he said that people suddenly began, people in his, people, um, government ministers, sorry, I'm, it's, it's quite early in the morning and I'm, I'm, I'm chewing over my words a little bit. Government ministers began to be scared to speak up in meetings because they knew that the records of those meetings would eventually be released. And it meant that this meant that the decisions weren't being made as well as they could have been. And it also meant that when the press was asking for freedom of information and asking for um, records of meetings, that these, these minutes were just being used to attack politicians or say, look, there's disagreement here, or that they were being used in a way that wasn't, in a way, wasn't being used to make things transparent. It was used in a way to make things bad. Um, so, for example, say me and you had a debate about something. So say me and you were going to change something and we had a debate about it and I'm for it and you're, you're against it. And you win, the, you win the debate and we so we eventually decide we're not going to do it. And I say, okay, fine. We've debated it. We've discussed it. We're all going to go along with it. We're not going to do it. Great chat. Thank you very much. But then someone comes along and says, right, freedom of information. I want the minutes of this meeting. And they say, look, Mr. Cox and, and you disagree. Look how divided these people are. Oh my God, this is a complete mess. Chaos. Um, and that was happening a lot, and it was made, and, and it was very frustrating for politicians who were then kind of like, well, I, I need to be careful what I say in these meetings because it will be released. Um, so it politically become very, very difficult. But the biggest impact of the Freedom of Information Act that has harmed politics massively is what became known as the MP's expenses scandal. Now, when you have a job you are allowed to claim for things called expenses. So let's say I went on a bit of teacher training um, and I pay for my train fare to go to this training. And maybe it's a, a stay over one, so I have to pay for a hotel. What I do then is I then go to my boss and I kind of say, well, um, I had to pay for my travel and my accommodation. These are my expenses um, and you pay for these. And your boss will say, yes, because that was part of your work. Um, however, I'm not going to pay for the, well, I'm not going to pay for the PlayStation you bought on route. Um, so an expense is something that you spend as part of your job that your job will then pay you for. It's not the same as your salary because the salary is something you get, you get paid to you. It replaces things that you Now, lots of journalists started trying to use the Freedom of Information Act to find out what MPs were claiming expenses for. And, and I'll be completely blunt here. MPs are and should be allowed to claim expenses. There's nothing wrong with that. We, you will do it as part of your job. I do it as part of my job. But where it gets scandalous is when people are claiming public money for things that either they didn't buy in the first place. So say, for example, I didn't stay over somewhere and then I claim that for expenses. Or let's say I did claim for that PlayStation. Um, I think that would be an improper use of my expenses. The Freedom of Information Act meant that the MP's expenses were revealed through partially using the act and partially through a government. There was actually a leak at the time as well. 
And oh my goodness, MPs were were claiming taxpayers' money on all sorts of things that was they should not have been. You can see the headline here: the phantom mortgage. So a mortgage that didn't exist was being claimed for uh, insurance that wasn't going on. And famously, one MP claimed one thousand six hundred pounds of public money for a little house for ducks in his pond with a moat or something like that. And then there was loads and loads of others. People claiming for two houses simultaneously, which there is an argument for if, you're, if you live in the north but have to work in the south. Um, but there was all sorts of claims. And it really, really damaged the relationship between the public and, and politicians. And in many ways, it hasn't really covered. Like, if you think, if I say to you, like, a politician, do you like politicians? You know, so many people have a reaction now to go, ugh, politicians, they lie, they cheat all this kind of stuff and there's various reasons for that but a big this was a big deal in changing how people in the uk thought about politicians that has never really recovered um it eventually led to the resignation of the speaker at the time who was a man called george martin i think um because he refused to say that there was a problem and an issue here it has led to reforms in terms of um expenses thank goodness um but it it was one of the unintended consequences. Now, you could, of course, say, well, that's a good thing. Of course, finding out what MPs were doing with expenses uh, is a good part of the Freedom of Information Act. So by all means, you can you can turn this paragraph into a negative or, or into a positive. Um, but it's uh, it was definitely a big thing. The Supreme Court, possibly my favorite one. You might, you might kind of get through these videos that I have a bit of a passion for kind of the, the legal side of things. Um, the... Supreme Court was is the highest court in the United Kingdom and actually in other countries as well. Other countries, some other countries use our use our court and it opened in 2009. And we'll talk about this more when we get to the unit. Um, but the idea was to create something that was separate and independent from Parliament. Um, it was modelled a little bit on the American system but with some particular changes. Um, previously, there were lords in the House of Lords that were the senior lords. And so if you think about the separation of powers, that meant that the judiciary was also in the legislature, so the British separation of powers just wasn't there, um, or arguably wasn't there. And uh, so the idea was to separate them both physically and practically and ideologically from the legislature, and to put together a transparent nomination procedure for who should be the Supreme Court judges. And so what they have is an independent commission, basically members of the judiciary and other key figures decide who the new Supreme Court judges should be. It is not really a political decision. Unlike in America, this is Amy Conan Barrett, who was appointed by Donald Trump to be the next Supreme Court judge in the US. In America, political decisions are, um, Supreme Court nominations are political, biased, I hope I can say that, um, and Done by the president in the UK, Supreme Courts are Supreme Court judges are nominated by an independent commission who are trying to balance out the genders, the nationalities, the the regions, the legal experiences of Supreme Court judges. And the Supreme Court in the UK, as a result of these reforms, has become a lot more powerful, become a lot more prominent in the life of the UK, and you've probably seen it. Um, uh, some of the key decisions that the Supreme Court has made, whether it's looking at uh, when they un unprogged Parliament, hello, uh, when they unprogged Parliament, when they um, did the Belmarsh case, when they uh, made some rulings on 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 uh, on on Europe, when they when they told Theresa May that she had to take um, Brexit through Parliament. We'll, we'll look at these when we do the Supreme Court. But but in short, the impact has been a, a judiciary that is far more likely to intervene in British politics. Than before when they tended to kind of capitulate to what the the government wanted so there they are those are the key constitutional reforms from 1997 to 2010 under the blair government which reform do you think was the most important the least important which do you think was the most successful which do you think was the least successful which do you think were completed which do you think were not completed and um, this half an hour lecture of course is just the introduction to these ideas you now need to go and have a little read about them in various textbooks um, and there's so many resources and discussions on these. What were the ones they missed out? Should they have codified the British Constitution? Should they have um, gone further on electoral reform? Um, that there were other things they could have done and, and they didn't. But this was a pretty exciting period of constitutional change in British history. And there'll be loads to talk about in our seminar. Thank you for watching. If, you're, if you haven't yet liked the video and subscribed to the channel, please do. Uh, leave me a comment to tell me what you liked and if I made any mistakes. And I'll see you. Um, in our next lecture. Take care. Bye-bye.